if you want to maximize engagement on social media, the one action you should ask people to take is to share a story about how bad the world is doing. Yeah. By and far, that will get you most engagement, right? Yeah. And the reason I say that is a lot of influencers on social media, right? We're telling people to take the wrong action. We're telling people to spread more of the bad news. The truth is we actually have more capacity as individuals than at any previous point in time to actually make a difference. We have far greater tools. Pleasure to see you, Michael. Where where are you located, by the way, Michael? Um, I live in Brooklyn, New York, um, and so just got back from Ghana this morning, so here in New York. Oh, good. So we're going to get full jet lag version of that. <laughs> How long were you out there for this time? Uh, um, well, I was in Geneva. I, I was on a bit of a whirlwind trip. So I was in Geneva, London, and um, Ghana. So in Ghana, I was only there for like 24 hours. So a quick trip. That is a quick trip. So did you fly on Swiss out? To Ghana or somebody else? Uh, to Geneva, I went to buy Delta and then British Airways down from London to Ghana and then on United uh, today. So you were trotting around the globe. Uh, how, how much time do you spend on the road? How much time do you spend in Brooklyn? Um, I would probably say... 60 40 i mean it, it it can vary um this year um you know we've i mean to be honest before i had my daughter and before the pandemic i, I have a six month old but before then i could be on the road for months on end like you know you take this week i probably would have stayed in europe because i have to be back there next week so i probably would have just stayed with friends worked remotely and yeah as you do this this time it feels like you know all my trips are very quick because i'm keen to get back to new york um, yeah. but also my wife and i have been able to make it work where you know because she can work remotely with her job that we've been able to do a few trips together so um we went we went back to australia for a month or all, all of march for instance we were is your wife there, australian as well fun. Uh, she's actually originally from China, but she moved here when she was 18 for college and then um, studied here and worked in New York. So we we met here in New York, actually. Yeah, it's great. And so how's your daughter doing? Six months old. She's good. She's good. Um, very grateful to our in-laws who have recently arrived, which is why I planned this trip around it. But no, she's good. She's just started eating solid. She just had a six month shot. So she's That's gone. Great. She's gone well. Oh, that's really good. Well, you know, three of my five grandchildren live across the street from me. And the last 15 years, my wife, Jeannie, and I have been doing a lot of child care. And we both work from our home as well. So we're able to slide scheduling around. And it's good. Well, so this good. daughter of yours is going to save your life because she's going to keep you off the road a little bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Although I would have to say, because our parents, are, I mean, you know, our family's global, right? So because my parents live on the other side of the world, we're all going to Greece next month for of the course. summer. Well, so we're going to have to travel so, to see them. Well, to, my, it, my it, daughter it, lived it, in exactly. Finland. Yeah, I, I get that routine because my oldest child, Jessica, lived in Finland and had her kids there and they lived in, in Scandinavia for 20 years. So, you know, I understand the, the long distance visits. Yeah, exactly. Good. Well, hey, so, let me introduce yeah. you uh, properly. Um, this is In Conversation with Frank Schaefer, and I am Frank Schaefer, and we go live on YouTube, and then this can be found all sorts of places where podcasts show up. And today, my guest is policy entrepreneur, author, and co-founder of Global Citizen, Michael Sheldrick. And Michael is the author of a book, which I have just finished reading, called From Ideas to Impact a playbook uh, for influencing and implementing change in a divided world. And and Michael, I just want to show you um, one thing here. I don't know if you can see how dog-eared your book wow. is. Wow. Okay. Wow. So when I said I read it, I'm talking read it, not skimming. You did. Wow. And I have many quotes marked <laughs> that I want to go through today and really dive into and talk with you about. So... Um, First of all, let me just 
ask you about yourself. I mean, I've got all the PR stuff here and I've got, I've read the back of the book. <laughs> Let's talk briefly about your, your career because it's not your usual career. You involved with public policy, you're involved with bringing change, environmentalism, all sorts of things. You just got back from Ghana. Just take a minute and give me the pitch about who you are and what you do. And then the rest of the time, I want to talk about the ideas in your book. And by the way, this is a good book. I really enjoyed reading it. I learned a lot. Anybody who wants Thank to change you. anything in this world, here's your hand, Bob. No excuses now. You've got the book on how to do it. <laughs> Uh, from Ideas to Impact, a playbook for influencing and implementing change in a divided world. And it really well put together. So first of all, congratulations. And we're going to dive Thank into the Thank you, Frank. But tell it, you. Uh, let's pretend we're seated next to each other on an airplane and you're foolish enough to have a conversation with me and I'll put <laughs> your earbuds in. And I say, what do you do for a living? <laughs> well, well, Frank, really appreciate it. So as, as I mentioned in the book, I'm a policy entrepreneur. And policy can seem like one of those words, which is abstract, which is vague. But yeah. the point I make in the book is, is policy is really about human beings. It's both mm -hmm. in terms of the people it impacts, it's all around us, but also it's in terms of the people who actually shape policy. And yeah. that extends far beyond people in government. It can be cultural icons like Taylor Swift, business leaders and everyday citizens. But how, how I got involved in changing policy for good is is uh, my story is you know if I cast myself back twenty or so years ago when I was in high school started high school first year of high school was ranked bottom bottom of the class right I wasn't going anywhere I wasn't great at sport which in Australia by the way where I was brought up is kind of like blasphemy if you're not great mm -hmm. at sport um, but I wasn't great at academics until one day this teacher for whatever reason, saw something in me that I didn't see myself. He said, mm -hmm. I think you can be number one by the end of the year, but you've got to work hard. And because of that teacher, because of the the attention he gave me, because of the difference he made in my life, mm -hmm. I went from bo bottom of the class to top of the class. Four mm -hmm. years later, finished high school, got into law school. Suddenly people were like, wow, you're so smart. You're so intelligent. And I'm like, no, I'm not. I remember what it was like to feel like lazy, stupid, a loser. Mm -hmm. That's what people said of me. And I remember the difference teacher made in my life. And mm -hmm. I became acutely aware that around the world, there were millions of children that maybe they didn't have access to a great teacher or Maybe they didn't have access to healthcare and died before the age of five, so they didn't even make it into school. But essentially, it was this injustice that millions of children would never achieve their potential because mm. of something as basic as access to great teachers. And so originally how I got involved had nothing to do with policy, right? As many people, some even listening to this call, you just want to make a difference. I thought, well, what am I going to do? I'm going to donate to charity. So it turned out one of the few things I was good at um, one of my superpowers in the book, and you probably, um, sorry, in, in my life, but you probably yeah. picked this up in the book, was I had the ability to ask people for stuff for free, right? Mm. So I went around shopping center, got things like vouchers, got things like free coffee. And I did a quiz night at my old school. And we built, a th we built, we basically were able to raise $1,000 to build schools in countries like Papua New Guinea. And in my summers and winters, when I had the chance to visit these schools, I would be like, wow, okay, it's amazing. This funding helped build bricks and mortar, but who's paying the teachers? Who's putting mm -hmm. meals on the, on the table? Some of the kids that go to these schools, that's the only meal they will have sure. in a day. And then I thought, well, you then replicate that out across all countries around the world. No amount of charity night, gala dinners, quiz nights is going to raise yeah. the billions needed to end extreme poverty. It's a $100 billion a year poverty um, question. And so that's where I got interested in policy because I was like, government decisions can, government decisions on trade, government decisions on debt, government decisions when it comes to foreign aid or development assistance mm -hmm. can play a big role. And I guess coming back to university, it was right on the cusp of um, social media coming out and we pioneered approach um, utilizing social media, popular yeah. culture, musicians, and we call it pop and policy. So mm -hmm. popular culture and policy. And it was really about leveraging that power to not just mainstream awareness of these issues, but provide a way for people to take action. Mm -hmm. And it was really rooted in the idea that everyday citizens can change policy. And that became really the genesis of global citizen was to change po policy in order to to end extreme poverty. And that, mm -hmm. that's really what I've been doing the last 10, 
15 years. Um, and so uh, that's really the genesis behind the book is to help people launch their own campaigns to make a difference. Yeah. And of course, we're living in a period of time with, between the environmental movement and uh, policy questions and all the rest of it, where I think, again, from ideas to impact, a playbook for influencing and implementing change in a divided world, uh, you know, this should be under everybody's arm as they march around <laughs> trying to change things and and maybe learn how to do it the right way. Because I think a lot of the activism these days is not terribly positive and actually sets some movements uh, back a step. Um, and I'm not going to get into, you know, my views on different ways of doing this because this is yours. Um, one thing I just want to do is mention that when I read your book, uh, it brought to mind somebody else who I've interviewed on my podcast a couple of years ago, who actually is a friend of mine, and that's Matthew Barzun, who is the wow. was uh, the ambassador to the United Kingdom from the United States for wow. um, Barack Obama, and before that, the ambassador to Sweden, and also is an independently wealthy entrepreneur himself because he started some tech companies, sold out, and made a, a lot of money. Um, and he wrote a book called The Power of Giving Away Power. And wow. basically, um, Matt, in a way, wrote the book, which sort of should be, if I was teaching a course, I would tell people to read both books, um, maybe read his first in terms of the philosophical principle of the power of giving away power. And he knows everybody, you know, as you do, by the way. We're going to have to do some name dropping here to let people know how important you are. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll talk about some of the heavy hitters you've known, um, and you're one yourself. But uh, Matt is someone who reached out to me. He had read some of my work. And when he was ambassador to Sweden, he invited me over there just to visit the, the embassy. Um, I wasn't able to go. I always regret that. It would have been fun to do a state dinner or something. And then um, <laughs> later when he was in London as the ambassador of the United States to, to the UK, he did something very unusual um he he broke all the ambassadorial rules and instead of doing a lot of official big functions and this is where your story riffs exactly with his he decided that what the ambassador from the united states should be doing is reaching directly with no filters to students and not wow. university students and not cambridge and oxford working class ordinary british uh schools and I won't say public school, because as you know, being a UK, not from the UK, but, you know, that's private school in high school, but public school in the American sense of the word. He didn't do a few. He did dozens and dozens and dozens of these. So on any given day, Matt Barzan could be found in a British classroom talking to 12 to 20 to 30 to 100 students and not lecturing them, but asking them as the representative of the United States of America, what could we be doing better for you and for the world? And so he had a tremendous interactive relationship and the British media and everybody got onto this. Well, then wow. he went from that and he he was um, Barack, he was designed Barack Obama's fundraising campaign for both presidential runs, raised tens of millions of dollars for him by doing the small donation thing, which he spearheaded. So I'm thinking of Matt because at some point you would wow. need to talk with Matt because he's into what you're doing um, in from a different angle. Um, and we can make that introduction. But I'm just telling people that it, for those of you who understood what the power of giving away power was about, and the title is exactly descriptive, From Ideas to Impact, a playbook for influencing and implementing change in a divided world is about, I wouldn't say powerful people, but enabled people sitting up and taking notice and saying, you know, there's a hurting world out there. What can I do? I can't do everything, but what can I do? And I, I would say, having read this book and just finished it this morning, um, you know, if you want to do something effective, whether it's in the environmental area or racism, you go into South Africa, the apartheid regime, what happened there, you have a lot of sort of anatomy studies of how to change things. This is the book. Let me let me jump in before we go too far into just talking about all this. And um, the first thing I want to do is read you something uh, from the prologue um, where you quote Gandalf the wizard from Tolkien. And, the Lord <laughs> of the Rings. and I knew I liked you the minute I saw this as your quote from the prologue. It's a dangerous business, Frodo, going out your door. You step onto the road, and if you don't keep your feet, there's no knowing 
where you might be swept off to. And I thought that was a great way to set up your story because you've certainly been swept off and also mm -hmm. the whole book. Um, and as a Tolkien fan, someone who enjoyed those books immensely over the years and read them all to my children, uh, I like the fact you started your book with that. But anyway, now to go on to something else here. Um, I wanted to read a little bit here from the prologue just to set your book up for you uh, to my, my listeners. Despite our divisions, however, there is hope. Worldwide, people from all walks of life demonstrate that systematic change is achievable and flourishing through united voices, cooperation, and solidarity often hidden from view, but undeniably present. And then just skipping a bit, a significant global population supports bold policy changes for the benefit of our planet and its inhabitants. And then just skipping a bit. In this book, I will demonstrate how we can unite relevant stakeholders, bridge differences, and contribute to implementing the policies needed to address our shared challenges together. By the time you finish reading, you will be able to identify how you can contribute uniquely to the policy process and understand how to transform well-meaning intentions into positive impact. So the prologue sets it up really well. That's the book. Um, before we go into some more quotes from the book and talk about them, just riff on that a little bit in terms of take us a little further. You mentioned in the book that one way to tell your story and to point all this out is to tell some stories. So why don't you give me some examples of you doing what you're talking about right here in the prologue and how it's worked out and pick any of the ones you talk about in the book or maybe ones I don't know about because uh, you know they're not in the book. But what would jump out if someone said, okay, fine, give me an example of what you're talking about here that you yourself have seen happen because of your or somebody else's activity? Yeah, well, really appreciate it, Frank, and appreciate just the amount you read, you absorbed, and you reading it back to me. It's really wonderful. And by the way, I the, this the about the quote from Gandalf. You know, I when I was writing the, the prologue, that just occurred to me. I, I was a massive Lord of the Rings fan as a, as a kid, and you know, some of the pitfalls I point out early on in the book when people start um, running a campaign, no matter what the issue is, they fall into several traps. One is is to focus on the problem innately and just to talk about the problem as if that's going to solve it itself without focused on the solution. The second thing, and I, I mentioned this in the prologue, is to get hooked on the dopamine high that comes from taking down the other. And I think one of the traits of today's world, when people feel powerless or they lack um, agency and they feel apathetic, sometimes they channel that by other distractions, right? And this is where I say it's a dangerous business because one of those um, one of those distractions can be shaming or policing others, mm. right? Mm. And and look, when you look at climate change, we're, we're all hypocrites. None of us um, are perfect, but sometimes we convince ourselves we're making a difference by pointing out the flaws of others or, mm. or by policing and getting others to say something so we can go to the pub in the evening, have a beer and say, hey, we got this person to post something on a social media account mm. the and and one of the other traits of course is people thinking they know all the answers and that they can do everything and one of the points i make in the book is no one can do everything but everyone can do something mm. and to go to the opposite side of that to now look at some of the success stories whether it was leaders of marginalized communities whether it was people in business whether it was everyday citizens whether it was trade union labor leaders mm. one of the traits is that they all almost it, it almost um, embodied the flip side of all of the different pitfalls I mentioned. They had a very clear grasp of the problem they were trying to solve, but also had a very clear sense of a solution. Mm. The second aspect was that they also engaged in pragmatic idealism. So they recognized creating change involved engaging with people who you may not always like or agree mm. with 100%. Mm. And the th final point was they recognized how to leverage the strengths of others, right? And just to give you a very clear, concrete example, okay, you wanted name drop in 2018. Yeah, drop a name so in, six, impress us. Tw 20, 2018, six years ago, 
um, we were invited just as global citizen to come to South Africa to do a campaign and event to mark what, have, what would have been the 100-year centenary of the birth of Nelson Mandela, right? Mm. And we managed to bring Beyonce, Jay-Z, Ed Sheeran, Oprah Winfrey, you know, Bob Geldof, all of these big names in the world. Hopefully mm. they're, they're big enough <laughs> for you in terms of names drop. Um, and we announced this campaign in July 2018, and three handles were trending, or three hashtags were trending. The first was Mandela 100. The second was Beyonce, of course. Mm-hmm. Everyone was going crazy that we were bringing her out to South Africa for this occasion. The third issue was called It's Bloody Time. And mm-hmm. I looked into where this hashtag was coming from, and it was from these phenomenal young woman advocates who had basically launched a campaign very clear sense they said look in south africa there's a problem girls drop out of school when they hit puberty and they can't afford period products whether that's tampons or sanitary pads and napkins and it was pointed out to me by these advocates that some girls lose up to 60 days a year from education because they Mm -hmm. lack access to sanitary pads and napkins or period products and and their view was you could make this more accessible through two ways by removing it from the tax code, because in many countries in the world, these products are taxed as luxury goods, and not just to remove the tax on these goods, but to actually make them accessible in particularly schools in in lower income neighborhoods across the country of South Africa, right? The second thing is that they were willing to reach out and engage. And one Mm -hmm. point I often say to young advocates who reach out to me, don't think you have to reinvent the wheel. Don't think you have to create an event over here or build your own organization. Go out and ask others to use their platform because they might be happy, to your point on Matt's book, giving sure. away power, they might be happy to give you a voice. And in this, they reached out to us and they said, would you be a platform to leverage and to raise um, traction on this campaign? Mm-hmm. And in this, we were we were happy, I guess, to be leveraged. So we met these women. And I still remember when we said this was going to be one of the key issues of the campaign, I mm-hmm. still remember officials in government telling us you know, this is not worthy of Nelson Mandela's name. And this shouldn't be the key issue. But you know what? Over several months, this became the most popular campaign we had run in the country. Sure, Millions of people took action. Hundreds of thousands of people sent in tweets, emails, phone calls. This really resonated. I still remember when we walked in to see one of the government ministers in the parliament in Cape Town. The whole table rocked when they put this petition on the table. And then I remember at this event, long story short, and it was full of drama like right up to the moment oprah winfrey was introducing the president before jay-z and beyonce took the stage a hundred thousand people in fmb stadium which was incredible i mean it's where they did the fifa world cup final in 2010 it almost didn't happen and i still remember the president announcing he had heard this call and would address the needs of the guild chart and provide sanitary dignity and address period poverty throughout the country. And you know what? It was the tenacity, the ongoing efforts of these advocates working together, including government, that have meant that since that announcement, four million girls have now had access to period products, sanitary pads, um, sanitary napkins. Mm -hmm. And by the way, that's four million girls that may not have had to drop out of school as a result and lose 60 days of education and that came from these savvy advocates willing to work willing to look at others and and willing to make the ask um and work and work with you yeah that's i'm so glad you chose that example that's that's terrific um thank you and i am going to just move on a little further into the book on page 33 here i i wanted to give a context to everything you're doing and what i think must be the most perennial pro problem you now face across the planet, but certainly here in the United States. And this paragraph sort of sums it up. Um, And I wrote a little note here. You can see my scribbles on the book. Uh, (laughs) This is where we are. And here's what you say. In times of hyperpolarization, individuals in positions of influence are under tremendous pressure to emphasize their loyalty to a particular size side of the ropes to fit in and be identified with one specific partisan group. Demonstrating support for the other side of the rope leads to cries of betrayal and harsh political consequences. And so we have these kind of hardened absolutists politically and or religiously and or culturally and or racially and or 
ethnically and or gender defined identity positions, by the time you're done with all that, how does you your organization, how does you know Michael Shell himself working with all these people, but also just on the ground, put it together? Because it seems that you know there's almost no area where you can say anything where it hasn't been politicized or someone has not claimed this issue as their own. I mean, we even get into this in the in the arts in that I'm a novelist, I'm a writer. And increasingly you hear from the sort of sensitivity readers, but you're a white male, how do you write a woman's voice? And, you know, at a certain point you're saying to yourself, well, wait a minute, you know, literature is, and art is imagination of trying to imagine you are the other person. I mean, you're a white male and you're raising hundreds of millions of pounds or dollars or something for an issue in South Africa to help young black women finish school. Um, you know, if we did it all based on gender divisions and politics, you understand what I'm talking about. So I would imagine uh, abso the absolutely yeah. the context of everything you're doing must be affected by this kind of divisive spirit of absolutism of identifying whose side are you on. I'm not going to, you know, answer your question for you, but I'm interested if I've hit it on the head in terms of just a big issue. A hundred, a hundred percent. And look, there, there are many examples of where I've seen leaders who have navigated those divides, who have had the courage. You know, I, I in the book, I share some of the stories of the campaigners involved in the Inflation Reduction Act. And if you want an example of a movement that's torn itself apart and missed opportunity after opportunity over the last 30 years, it's, it's the environmental movement, right? And yet, you know, I was yeah. speaking to this one guy who was involved in building the consensus to get the Inflation Reduction Act passed. And he told me about, he literally said, not only do we have retreats, we had sleepovers and we brought mm -hmm. together those who were on the on the crazy, like he said, lefty side and those who were so conservative, they wouldn't even mention the words climate change. Yeah. There's obviously other leaders, like I talk about Mia Motley, the prime minister of Barbados, who's literally trying to build those um, bridges over those divisions. But in terms of my, my experience, right, you know, often I found the true North when you're navigating those situations and you're wondering, what do I do? And it feels like you're damned if you do, you're damned if you don't. How do I stick my neck out here? Is to actually ask communities impacted. And we don't do that enough because mm. what's what's interesting, Frank, you just shared that you got a, you, someone will, will criticize you for trying to write and imagine a woman's voice in a particular situation, right? That empathy, right? Um, and they're, they're assuming that they know, like the exact woman you're writing in the exact context you're writing, sure. they're assuming that they speak to all, for all women in that mm -hmm. situation, right? And often I find that people hurtling criticism make assumptions which aren't even true. And to mm -hmm. give you, to give you um, a couple of examples of, of where I've seen this borne out a lot. One one example, I mean, I mentioned I had just come from Ghana, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and, I, and I talk about this in the book, you know, uh, about a situation two years ago when we were doing this big campaign in Ghana, we were bringing this big event, we were bringing Usher. Mm. At the time, a bill was going through the parliament that would ban homosexuality across the, the country, not just ban it, but actually criminalize advocacy on the issue. So even to advocate for LGBTQ rights was illegal. And I got calls, we got calls, should we boycott the country? Should we withdraw? And mm -hmm. a lot of these calls were coming from well-meaning ad advocates in the global North, in, in America, in Britain. They said, that's outrageous. And so in the end, I thought, well, what am I going to do here? I, I don't want to further marginalize people, but also I don't want to make hasty decisions that might inadvertently be counterproductive and actually lead to this bill being passed, right? Mm. And because I was also aware of who I was as a Westerner, I didn't want it to be like, okay, you're coming in and preaching and sure. we're going to use that against you. And so I went out and I actually spoke to some of the NGOs representing those communities and i spoke to colleagues who had had those conversations and they made two observations the first thing they said is you know it's interesting that you're you're weighing up do you boycott or do you engage and that was never a serious mm. prospect but it was they just thought it was interesting people were asking us to do that because they, the point they made is does that mean that global citizen because you campaign on sexual reproductive health and rights does that mean you're never doing an event in america now 
but since Roe versus Wade was overturned, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. So don't sure. don't assume because a government's talking about one thing, or not even a government, a few elected officials, that it speaks for a whole population. Yeah. Um, the, the second point they made was, you know, you coming in boycotting and not having any engagement, that would be one of the worst things. Yeah. Because you would give fodder to those who just believe LGBTQ rights are Western human rights. Yeah. And basically you would fast track it. And they said, listen, the best way you can help us, honestly, in this situation is by giving us a platform, giving us a voice, making us visible, but letting us tell that story mm -hmm. right on our platform. And, and that's what we did. Um, we didn't attempt to speak for them. And anyone that came to us and said, oh, well, why are you, why are you activating in this country? That's exactly what I told them and, yeah. and had those conversations. And I don't think we do that enough to actually go to communities and say, well, how can I help you? How can I, how can I best share those stories? And often I find people people want the help and they love the fact that they stand in solidarity. Another another example, just very quickly, was in Kenya last mm -hmm. year. They were hosting this summit around climate change with all these young people. And there was reports in the media around, okay, these Western groups getting involved, should the event be boycotted? And some people were about to sign on. And I said, well, let's actually speak to young people in Kenya. Sure. What do they want? And I got one of these young campaigners on the phone from Kenya. And he told, you know, colleagues and other partners, hmm. he said, that's the worst thing. Don't, don't boycott. You know, that's the worst thing. And I think yeah. many impacted communities actually understand that you can't apply a binary bias or a purity test to their sure. work. They understand that making a difference is shades of gray more than anyone. Mm -hmm. And so my advice is if you're in that conundrum, how do I make a difference? People are telling me not to say one thing to do this, go and speak to the communities um, that, who are actually impacted. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Let me reintroduce you here. Uh, if you are listening to and or watching in conversation with Frank Schaefer, it goes off as a YouTube live event and a few other places live, and then um, goes to podcasts wherever they're found. My guest today is policy entrepreneur, author, and co-founder of Global Citizen, Michael Sheldrick. Michael is also the author of a new book, From Ideas to Impact, a playbook for influencing and implementing change in a divided world. And I, at the beginning, was showing... Michael, that not only have I read it, but it is thumbed well, <laughs> scribbled all over, which is the way you honor a book, at least a nonfiction book. Um, let me read something that I think it, it brings up the next little bit that I want to talk about. Um, this is, I think, page 71 in your um, step eight, communicate stories of success. Real stories give us hope. They show us that our actions matter when you've translated a commitment into tangible impact. Share that story with your networks. Inspiring others to believe in the potential for change is crucial for driving progress and countering disillusionment in the state of democracy and global solidarity. And there's a couple of things there I'd like you to delve into. Um, the word disillusionment jumps out because I think we feel disillusioned about so much these days. Part of that is because there's a lot to be disillusioned about. It also seems to me as someone who's now 72 and been around before social media, that some of that disillusionment is simply because so many things are thrown at us. It isn't that actually anything is worse or better. It's just that we're getting all these little bits of information which are upsetting. And it used to be that you got a newspaper thrown on your lawn, you read the daily news, it had already gone through an editorial process that weeded out things, you weren't overwhelmed yeah. all the time. So I don't think some of this is real, but I think some of the disillusionment is real. So I'd like you to speak to that aspect in terms of motivating people to do anything against this backdrop of disillusionment and despair up into the point where at least in Western cultures, developed cultures, so to speak, we have these massive epidemics, pandemics of depression and teen suicide and self-harming and a sense of powerlessness, people stuck on their mobile phones, earbuds plugged in, less eye contact, less community. In this environment, writing a book called 
From Ideas to Impact, a playbook for influencing and implementing change in a divided world. If you picture someone sitting there staring at their feet, you know, or playing a video game on their phone, plugged in earbuds so they won't hear you if you say hello and they happen to be walking by, this yeah. is a tough context in which to get anybody to do anything. And I, I wonder if you you can address that because obviously you work with younger people across the planet. So you must have some sense of where their heads are at. Yeah, so I, I would say I would say several things on that. The first is the reason why I make this a principle in of itself is because the research shows that especially when we don't trust what's coming at us from the media or the social media, when we look at our friends and family, one of the best ways to motivate someone to take an action is when they see other people take an action and they see the impact of the results and they hear about that. That's by far one of the best things we can do. And another author, Catherine Hayhoe, who wrote a book called Saving Us, which is about climate change and how, how to have conversations. She makes the point that rather than shaming people, if you're taking meaningful action in your own life, sharing that with others can be one of the best, most powerful sources of spearing others, others to act. I would say the second point I would make, and, and this is really a reflection on those of us with platforms, we spend a lot of time reinforcing the despair. We spend mm. a lot of time reinforcing disillusionment by the stories we tell or the actions we ask people to take. Mm -hmm. And I, I've seen this um, from my, my own work at Global Citizen, right? Um, in the book, I cite a study from NYU. It looked at 60,000 people across 60 countries. And sure enough, if you want to maximize engagement on social media, the one action you should ask people to take is to share a story about how bad the world is doing. Yeah. By and far, that will get you most engagement, right? Yeah. But if you want to instill in people a belief that their actions can make a difference, right? One of the actions to ask people isn't to share a bad story on social media. It's actually to sit down say with respect to climate change, sit down and write a letter to a future, can be a, a, a hypothetical kid, it can be a real kid, but a future family member, hypothetical or real, who will be alive in 2055 and living with the consequences mm. we're fighting today um, and, and the actions we're taking today. And in that letter, spell out to this future generation member all of the actions you are doing right now within your control to combat climate change. And people who did that, right, when they walked away, the act of writing that letter, it left them with a far greater belief that their actions can make a difference, that there's yeah. something for them to do. And the reason I say that is a lot of influencers on social media, right? We're telling people to take the wrong action. We're telling people to spread more of the bad news. And yeah. this is this leads me to my third point. The truth is we actually have more capacity as individuals than at any previous point in time to actually make a difference. We have far greater tools. And at the end of end of my book, I, I share a story. Um, as I as I finished writing the book um, and I was submitting the manuscript, my mom in Australia gave me a call. And mm. she said, there's a gentleman who's just checked in who you might remember. And she said, this guy is Len. And I immediately said to her, Len, you mean the older gentleman who lived at the bottom of the street? I would get home from school. I would walk my dog. And there was yeah. Len. He had two walking sticks. He had this dog, wiry, gray hair. Literally, the dog was called Tramp. And it looked like mm. the dog from mm. Lady and the Tramp. And I would talk to him about war stories, et cetera. Mom said, yes, that guy. And I said, well, how old is he? He was like, must have been in his 80s. And that was almost 20 years ago. She said, he's now 105 years old. Wow. And so that night I found myself, mom put him on FaceTime and I was FaceTime in Len. And he told me this story. He said he was born in 1917. He got married in 1939. This was in, in UK, England, shortly after the break of the war in, in, in Europe when Germany was invaded in France. He found himself in France, isolated as the Germans overran. And he recalled running up this hill at one point. He was running up the hill and a shadow came over him. And he looked up and he saw 200 German planes flying above him 
thought he was gone. He thought that was over. But fortunately, they, they didn't see him because he was one person. He ran around the hill, found this abandoned American car. He said, you beaut, got in his car. He drove to the coast, somehow managed to get on the last boat, leave in France before it fell to the German war machine, made it to England. And his superior officer said, go to this town, go to this town and defend the community. You're the only one there. You have to um, um, mobilize the villagers. So he goes to this town, literally German parachuters are jumping out the, uh, in the skies above, m rallies the villagers, porch, pitchforks and all. They go down to meet them. And I, and I said to Len, I said, how did you have hope? Did you think it was over? Like, how did you not mm. lose yourself to despair? And he said to me, he said, no. We looked at each other and we said, we haven't got much, but we're not running away. Mm. We'll give it a go. Yeah, We're not running away. We'll give it a go. Mm. And I think, you know, and, and, and he, um, a few weeks after I submitted the manuscript, by the way, he turned 106. His daughter came in and he said, you know, I've given it all. It's up to others to give it a go. And he yeah. passed away that evening. And I think now, you know, my book is an attempt to give people all of the answers, doesn't profess to have everything, but it is aimed for those people just looking for a start. The best way to begin is mm -hmm. to begin because change starts with us. And we have far more than what Len had yeah. um, 80 or so years ago. And it was pointed out to me by someone else that people alive today, you know, we we perhaps living in this moment in time where the actions we take today as individuals will have far greater impact on the future lives of people in five, 10, 15 years time mm. than any previous generation of humanity. Mm, mm, mm. And so we have a profound opportunity to make the biggest difference if, mm. if we choose to make it. And I'm seeing it again and again and those stories are out there those stories are happening we just have to remember to not lose ourselves in despair we have to jolt ourselves out of that and that's yeah where and, stories, and, and remind ourselves what you said important. earlier which was that the way to get the click sometimes is the bad news and we have to understand that's what's going on exactly so we, we exactly. are being manipulated by the algorithms as well because exactly. uh, you know they know, they know what's going to get our attention. That that's a lovely story. Let me um, just say we are talking to Michael Sheldrick um, from Ideas to Impact, a playbook for influencing and implementing change in a divided world. There's the book. I have notes throughout, and um, I'll just remind people that um, this is in conversation with Frank Schaefer, and I will ask you to subscribe to In Conversation with Frank Schaefer on Apple Podcasts so that you can hear this and other podcasts. Um, and to my Substack, it has to be said, where I make commentaries on various subjects. And we'll be talking about this book a little bit on my It Has to Be Said uh, Thank you. statement little thing as well. Um, let me just jump ahead here and and say um, a little a little uh, intermission from the from what we're talking about. I just ran, ran into something here when you were talking about community that jumped out in a weird context, kind of along with your Tolkien quote. And you were quoting Sarah Stanley, local colleague, community leader, and she says, "I'd love us to be known as more than a coal mining." town mm -hmm. we are very proud of our roots there's nothing wrong with that but that's not all we are i the context for that is that um i am a fan of and have been watching welcome to wrexham which is this documentary series about a small welsh town that two millionaire american actors have bought the local football wow. club and um they've made a huge go of it and basically it's a it i went i happened to be in a British boys boarding school uh, up in North Wales, very near Wrexham. And so um, wow. I know the area, but there's a town that was in absolute despair. Uh, and the only little shred of public life they had left in Wrexham, and this is a very popular documentary series on television. It's in its third season now. It's popular for a reason, and it actually ties in well with your book. And that is that all this little town had a defunct coal mining town really down at the heel, empty shops, nothing going on, was this one little soccer, as Americans call it, football club that the town grimly hung on to and financed themselves. And these two American actors 
who between them have hundreds of millions of dollars, um, found out about it and took a fancy to this and about five years ago started getting ready to buy the club and they have. And now they're in the third season of the documentary. But what is interesting to me is why the documentary is so successful is nothing to do with football. It's because of the fact that someone cared enough to come in and do something that was positive and gave everybody in that little town hope and brought them together as a community. And I think it's a wonderful kind of parallel to what you talk about in your book in so many stories. I know that's way off the subject, but no, uh, I love that. I love that. It really, uh, if you Amazing. if you and your wife want to kick back sometime and just really enjoy something, <laughs> watch welcome to Wrexham. Let me let know. me uh, read this from page one hundred and twenty three of your book that people really do have to read if they want to ever change anything in this life or actually do anything because it's kind of a handbook on how you get up in the morning and make make changes in any kind of area you're interested in. Not not to mention the activism you're talking about from the environment to racism to relationships and so forth. I can't recommend the book highly enough. In many parts of the world, just transitions face backlash. Sometimes it's due to entrenched interests or fundamental disagreements about the necessity of transitioning to clean energy. However, more often than not, it's because of poor implementation. To reiterate McCartney's words, quote, it doesn't work because it's not just, end quote, Instead of fostering collaboration, finding common ground and embracing what is both inevitable and possible, division and complacency take hold. Many simply do not begin early enough. Most critically, most critically transitions often fail to genuinely involve affected communities and give them a meaningful role in the process. The government tries to own it instead. And I think that your book is kind of an appeal to people to, first of all, put aside some divisions for the greater good, which sounds a little preachy, but it's up absolutely necessary. Um, you know, you can't hate the people you're working with. And if you yeah. won't work with anybody except those who dis who agree with you and that you like, you're not going to work with anybody. By the way, as somebody who's been married for 52 years, wow. <laughs> three years, um, you know, that's that's the way you make marriages work, too, or parenting or grandparenting, all of which I've done a lot of. And it, it's not by <laughs> emphasizing your divisions. It is by putting them aside and saying, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. You know, we have children. Let's make this work for them during, say, a bad patch, getting through it, going on. It, it's the same principle on everything. But what I want you to concentrate on here and maybe tell us some stories again that illustrate the point is both... Um, the mo most critical, most critically transitions often fail to genuinely involve affected communities and giving them a meaningful role. Now, you already told a wonderful story of the young women in South Africa who banded together and said it's about bloody time and how you involve them. And I know you've done other things like that and give you a chance to name drop a little more if you want. But tell us some <laughs> other stories that will inspire us. I'm going to be very specific here, to bridge differences with people we don't like or approve of who may be voting for different people than we like. But on this, whatever this is, we can agree. Because it seems to me we've all got to find what this is. Well, we're not going to get anything done on any of these issues because we're too divided. It's 50-50 all the way down the line on so many things. What are some things that we could say, hey, I hate your guts, but on this I'll work with you. Give us an example of where that's happened anywhere in the world, um, whether it's Northern Ireland and the peace process or something less newsworthy, just on a local level. Mm. Give us some hope that that can work. Hey, we can mm. agree on this. I don't like you and I'm going to vote for a different guy, but we can work on this. That has to be what we need to reach for on so many fronts. At least I, that's what I take from your book. No, well, I really love that, Frank. And by the way, I'm going to check out that show you mentioned in North Wales. It sounds really great. And by the way, Wales itself has become a little bit of a um, a social experiment or laboratory um, for many in in interesting policies. They also appointed the first ever commissioner of future generations, which mm -hmm. means that any policy or law that they're looking to pass or implement in Wales, they mm -hmm. have to take into account the perspectives of future generations not yet born, right? So yeah. it, it, it's a fascinating place. But I want to stick on that word community mm -hmm. because 
someone pointed out to me the other day and I, this wasn't intentional like i'd never explicitly say this in the book but someone said one of the through lines throughout the entire book is the word community. And I thought it was interesting that that's a word you latched on as well. And if we just stay with, since we've been talking about coal mines if we and, and coal plants and coal communities and co finding common ground around one thing, mm. I actually think the story I tell in the book um, from Western Australia, which is where I'm from, um, is, is insightful in that regard. So... Mm. When I was writing this book, I was acutely aware that if we're to address issues like climate change, you know, we have to, of course, shift our energy systems away from fossil fuels. Everyone knows that, right? Mm. The, the challenge is, is often in these debates, you know, people say, well, okay, is, is action on climate change, is it a zero-sum game? And is it going to come at the expense of people's livelihoods, sure. coal workers in West Virginia? You see this around the world, and this is why climate change becomes so contentious, because it's yeah. seen as a zero-sum game. And so I, I looked around for an example of one place where they were getting this right, or at least had some ingredients for what was the secret source here mm, to get mm. this right. And I landed on this town of Collie, Western Australia, and I went there. And it's a town which is, you know, probably a, a 100 year old coal reliant community. In fact, more, I would say more than a quarter of the jobs in this town are reliant directly on the coal industry and the other jobs and industries are somehow related to it. Um, and many of the families there are third, fourth generation coal families, right? And it was interesting because in many parts of the world, often you have this debate between environmentalists and local union leaders or local mm -hmm. workers. They 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 butt heads, right? And sure enough, that's that's how this one story began. Um, I went and met with one of the union leaders and who was involved in this process since the start. And he had this epiphany moment actually in 2007. He was watching Al Gore's Inconvenient Truth. And he said, my God, if we don't get ahead of this, everyone's taking action on climate change. Our town's going to be finished. There's going to be no demand for coal. And we're going to be, not, not only are we not going to have any jobs in this town, right? But the town itself will be finished. We have to move somewhere else. And so he, he describes this moment where they have this town hall, everyone's gathered together, right? And he says, we have to start planning for a post-coal world. And you can imagine how that happened, went down, mm -hmm. like a lead balloon. The audience was silent. And then suddenly someone gets up and they say, oh, Steve, you don't know the first thing about this community. And he said, when a baby's born here, they get two things. The first is they get their mother's milk. And the second is a lump of coal in their hand we're not going anywhere we're not changing from coal and then they all started yelling at you said him when he walked out the hall you know they all parted like a fish so he walked out and then he said five years later when the government suddenly started saying oh maybe coal's not feasible anymore economically he said the community welcomed me back like i was notre dame right yeah. and so yeah. from that point onwards right you get to the end of the story Almost a decade later, Steve, this union leader, is, is explaining this to me. There he is at the back of a workers' meeting. The governor of the state or is, is there, and he's announcing that the remaining coal plants will close in the next few years. Mm -hmm. Again, silent, and then suddenly one worker starts to clap, and the whole audience breaks out into applause, Right. And the reason why they embraced that closure, the reason why they weren't yelling, and this was over a course of 15 years, is because alongside that, millions of dollars had been invested in new businesses. They were constructing the largest battery storage system in the Southern Hemisphere, constructing new jobs. And the reason how this all came together was because environmentalists, climate negotiators, turned environmentalists, turned unionists, they all got together and campaigners that used to protest the coal plants and vice versa, um, they got together and they started having conversations. And for those coal workers, in many cases, it was the first time they actually spoke to an environmentalist. Mm -hmm. With the environmentalist, it was the first time they bothered to ask. And they recognized, yeah, you know what? Me saying 
don't worry, you can get a job. We're invest in a coffee shop over here, which is maybe a third of the salary you're currently getting when many yeah. of these co-workers pride themselves as energy workers. And where there was the overlap, if you drew a, a, a Venn diagram and you saw the part that overlapped, there was a poignant moment, which I describe in the book, where they had this discussion and they said, you don't get it. This yeah. is not about our jobs. This is about our home. Yeah. And as soon as they had that conversation, everyone got it, the value of home, because everyone could relate into sure. that, where you were coming from. And environmental campaigners and the co-workers made common cause mm -hmm. um, in advocating for investment in renewable and clean energy, in battery storage, when they came together. When they talked and to it each was, other. Exactly. And they identified that common common value, which was about home, which was about community, which transcended politics. Yeah, I am I'm going to replug your book here. I'm talking to Michael, who is the author of From Ideas to Impact, a playbook for influencing and implementing change in the divided world. And I'm Frank Schaefer. This is In Conversation With. Please subscribe to my Substack and um, all those good things. Um, let me just do another little quote here. Um, you say an effective policy entrepreneur identifies their leverage point and quickly discerns how to complement their approach through partnership. Well, the story you just told kind of makes that point. Um, and that that that's what we just talked about. But it brings me to, it's a good segue to what I wanted to go into next here. And... This is from your, let me see what chapter is this, conclusion being part of the solution in a world on fire. There is a stark difference between my unwavering belief in the potential for change and the often disappointing reality. It's a recognition that two things can be true simultaneously. Many people worldwide still maintain an enduring and resilient faith in the promise of democratic governance and international institutions such as the UN. Such faith persists even as po as people harbor concerns about their current performance. We already talked a little bit about the loss of faith and the kind of um, despair. I think another thing you need to address that you kind of address in the book uh, by telling the stories you do is a level of cynicism that cuts across all parties. You know, we have two candidates for president that are old and people... Uh, feel one, I happen to be one, is a criminal and should never have been elected in the first place and always has been a con artist. The other is definitely getting older. We live in troubled times. We're in the middle of Russia attacking Ukraine and a huge war in the Middle East. Um, not only is there a sense of powerlessness, but there is a cynicism. Just take, for instance, one type of story that breaks again and again and again, and that is, you know, many of our tech billionaires seem very disconnected from what actually happens as a result of their products. For instance, one of the first things that happened with AI that makes the news is these fake videos taking a teenage high school girl using her portrait that some boy or or other person hijacks. And then all of a sudden, you know, it's it's welded on with a porn star or someone doing something that she would never do. There's no recourse. Um, the tech bros seem totally disinterested in in doing anything about what you would call the collateral damage, which just exponentially increases from their footprint. That's the climate in which you're asking people to be involved. And you, and this, I don't want to put you on a in a hard place, but you, Michael Sheldrick, are raising money a lot of times or dealing with the very elites who seem to me, as an observer, to be pretty irresponsible when it comes to the use of their power and mm -hmm. often in what they don't care about. So when you mm -hmm. look at the final fallout from Facebook or or all the other products that Meta is involved with or what Elon Musk is doing or AI as it's now being kind of used without having think, thought it through, uh, you know, Scarlett Johansson has her voice stolen or imitated and it's denied and then there it is. You know, this is the world we're living in. The guys you're trying to raise money from you know, the old railroad barons, you know, were simple yep. to deal with by comparison. They built railroads, they polluted the thing, then they built wonderful museums. 
uh, like the Metropolitan Gallery of Art of New York. We knew what they did. They littered the world with libraries and cultural artifacts. They had a sense of public responsibility, even if they were, you know, not not such good people themselves. But we're into a generation of entrepreneurs because you la you're labeled as an entrepreneur. And their entrepreneurial efforts have seemed so selfish and so blinded by, you know, building your own rocket ship, whatever it may be, anything but taking responsibility for your product and what it is doing to people. And I just think your book, if I can be so bold, the idealism of your book, From Ideas to Impact, is on a collision course with the cynicism of a lot of the wealthiest people on this planet right now. And I just wonder how you react to that. No, I, I, I think it's a good question. And one thing I, I address head on in, in the book, and I actually have a whole section for advice to philanthropy on, on what they should be doing better. But one point I address head on is the idea of what I would say, the tech technological optimist, because also that, that cynicism, which you were, you were mentioning about, you know, tech billionaires in the world, they would also have you belief that they are the world's saviors, right? That technology alone is going to address all of our issues if we allow it to go unfettered. And one thing that I will say, and I've written on this recently, is, is I think there is a distinction between, say, ethics and AI, and AI that serves a beneficial purpose for society yeah and just to just to put a fine point on that you know a product can be ethically made right but it doesn't mean it's going to be used beneficially for society sure. you know and 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 all the stuff you're talking about with ai its uses privacy these are things that will be worked out right in the same way that vaccines vaccines right to to be used they have to be fda certified sure, sure. They have to be be approved by the world health organization that's all the ethics involved that's ensuring something's ethically produced mm. but it's much harder to say well how do you make sure these technologies are beneficial for society just before just because vaccines or drugs or medical health care is ethically produced doesn't mean that they're going to be made available to the masses of society, right? Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean that they're going to be equitably distributed as we saw during the pandemic when they were hoarded by a particular group. And so the real question is, how do you make sure technology is beneficial to society? And that's where policy comes in. And that's why you need policy entrepreneurs. Sure. And my, my appeal to philanthropy in the book is if you're serious, because some of them have started to talk about systemic change. Some of them have yeah, said yeah. we need system change. If you're serious, don't try and do that yourself. Invest in the advocates, the entrepreneurs yeah. who know how to do that. Invest in their capacity who are advocating for change. They're the policy entrepreneurs. Give them the platform so that we can actually make sure that these technologies, in many cases, you know, created by these people, as you said, who have then given away billions of dollars to make sure it benefits society as mm. as a whole. And and I think, you know, what are some of the kind of policies? Like, it's not lost on me. We spoke about the the, the rubber barons of the late 19th century and the Gilded Age. Sure. You know, ultimately, it was policies by leaders like Theodore Roosevelt, who I actually yeah. speak about in the conclusion living here in New York City. But many of that actually came from the policies he came in, antitrust laws, you know, policies to actually, um, you know, ensure that even people in New York tenement living in the tenements had a better standard of, of living. And you've seen that throughout my my fine point on that today is we don't have to wait for presidents alone yeah. to be able to promote policy. Back 100 years ago, or more than 100 years ago with Theodore Roosevelt, there was only a few thousand people in the whole of America who mm. could probably influence his decisions. And I think the big question for philanthropy is are they going to invest in the capacity of everyday citizens? And in the book, I propose some ways to do that. On Friday, when I was in London, I had some discussions with folks looking at different forms of democracy, um, things like global citizen assemblies, ways to give people a say in the decision making to actually move this along. And I guess yeah. where I where I still get my optimism from and hope is 
last year, you know, I was grappling. People say to me, well, what's an idea you're grappling with right now? It's from yeah, ideas yeah. to impact. Last year, we sought to have a look at the idea of global solidarity itself, mm -hmm. where we partnered with a think tank to measure global solidarity. And what yeah. we found is when you look at institutions, when you look at impacts, yes, we're, we're, we're in the danger zone. But the reason why we're not at breaking point right now is because of where people is at, the popular pulse of people. And there's still majorities, even if it's falter and majorities in countries yeah. like America that identify as global citizens that believe in the kind of bold ideas that we urgently need mm -hmm. to address um, the big challenges facing us. And I think philanthropy could play a huge role by investing in the capacity of policy entrepreneurs amongst people writ large to be able to address these big challenges. And that's that's my appeal to philanthropy. And I've been having that conversation again and again, because the data supports it when you look at where people is at. That's where I get my optimism from. Yeah. And, you know, we're going to wrap this up now, but it's a good segue into an idea that my producer, Ernie Gregg, uh, texted me during the conversation that I want to bring up. And that is, you know, I had talked about your book in the context of Matt Barzon's book, The Power of Giving Away Power. I think, you know, if Ernie can swing it, I'd like to get you back and Matt and have a discussion with the three of us about both of your books, but also the relationship of your work to his and his work to yours, because he put together this massive fundraising campaign for Barack Obama, then became ambassador to the UK, working with, I'm sure people you both know, you know, you, you share the same uh, um, cell phone numbers, probably with the kind of movers and shakers you deal with. But I really think that his title, The Power of Giving Away Power, is part of this formula. And you've just been talking about it with the philanthropy on a scale that could be scaled up to do some of the things you're talking about, as long as that money is not being spent by the person themselves who earned it, but working with people who are actually face to face with those who are being impacted, like your young women of South Africa who needed period products. So let me just finish by reading something here that's a nice place, I think, to wrap this up. While the tools and levers of policy entrepreneurship were traditionally reserved for those in positions of power, often rendered invisible to most of society, today they are accessible to all of us in the sunlight with the sunlight. So I love that idea of transparency and using some of these tech tools that I'm not particularly fond of, although we're using one right now, to talk to people, which is always odd to be railing on tech bros who invented the technology we're now talking on, um, hypocrisy aside. So I would like to just, again, tell people that if you want to do anything, whether it's in environmentalism or race relations or anything, um, From Ideas to Impact is a handbook. It literally tells you how to do this uh, with stories as well of how that has been affected and uh, Michael, we will link to anything you want us to link to in terms of putting people in touch with you who will be watching this Thank or you. listening to it. Ernie's very good at that. We will be back in touch with you about hopefully doing a a talk with you and Matt Barzan, um, who rose all that wrote, you know, raised all the money for for Barack Obama's presidential runs and also was an ambassador and had the experience of turning his ambassadorial role in the UK, which is our biggest ambassadorial appointment into a real um, thing, not just state dinners, but sitting down in the British public school system and talking with ordinary working class and middle class students about their concerns about America and the world. And he's such an interesting guy. And I'd love you to know him. You two that. are meant to to talk sometime. Maybe the first place we can do that is right here on In Conversation with Frank Schaefer. So listen, um, Thank you for being here and Thanks, please Frank. subscribe to In Conversation with Frank Schaefer on Apple Podcasts and to my Substack. It has to be said at Frank Schaefer, uh, Substack.com. And anything you want to add, Michael, before we wrap up? No, I would I would just say I love this. Thank you for providing the platform. I'll finish with a quote from one of my heroes, Eleanor Roosevelt, who of course co-wrote the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. She said the best way to begin is to begin. And so thank you, Frank, for kicking off this conversation. Really appreciate it. Good. And I really hope the book does well. A lot of people need to read this. So any any way we can help you um, spread the word, just let Ernie and me know and we'll get right out there. So thank you, Frank. All the best to you and your six-month-old daughter and to your wife and all your travels and safe journeys and come talk to us again. Thank you. Thanks for having thank us. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye.